Thank you very much for the invitation. It's been, uh, I've really enjoyed the uh, speakers so far. It's a great lineup. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we've been trying to do in terms of really delivering on um, precision medicine, though I'm not going to use that term uh, during my uh, talk. Um, so before we start, I just want to make sure everyone's orientated about cancer genes. So there are two different ways in which genes are important to cancer. Most of the things that you read about and you hear about are in relation to this uh, second bit here where um, mutations in the actual cancer tissue itself um, are driving mutations causing the cancer um, and are used for targeted therapies. But there's also uh, mutations that occur in the genetic makeup themselves, the germline mutations that can contribute to cancer. So genes in which germline mutations confer high or moderately clinically important risks of cancer are called cancer predisposition genes, and those are the genes I'm going to be talking about today. So these cancer predisposition genes have really high clinical utility and have done for at least 20 years. They're really important in giving more accurate diagnosis. They give opportunities for optimised management and follow-up. Increasingly, they are giving precision medicines, so PARP inhibitors for um, individuals with mutations in the BRCA genes are a real exemplar of precision medicine. And unusually for medicine, they also give us opportunities to implement prevention by um, uh, implementing strategies in relatives of people with these mutations to prevent them from getting cancer. And using these cancer predisposition genes, there are many opportunities for implementing more um, cost effective and uh, efficient healthcare. So there's strong clinical and economic rationale for greater genetic testing of cancer predisposition genes. And basically, we need to test more genes in more people. So I'm currently running a program called the Mainstreaming Cancer Genetics Program, which sits within a trinity of things that I'm currently leading. Um, I um, head up a, a research division at the Institute of Cancer Research, where we've been discovering cancer predisposition genes for the last 15, 20 years. I'm also, I'm a clinician, so I'm head of the Cancer Genetics Unit, where we're actually managing uh, patients with these mutations. And then uh, just over the last uh, 18 months, we've uh, set up a uh, UCAS accredited clinical testing lab, where we can actually uh, use these new technologies to, um, to um, do this testing in patients. So that's really giving us a way of really driving forward this um, initiative. So um, genetic testing is easy, we hear. Everyone says, are we really, are, why aren't we there yet? Um, and in part that's because um, people sort of think that a genetic test is equivalent to genome sequencing, and uh, obviously gen genome sequencing is now much cheaper. But when we talk about that $1,000 or however much it is, that really is only the sequencing. And a genetic test involves a lot more than that. Um, and we found the analogy of a book to be really helpful in explaining this to people. So when you're making a book, you obviously need the letters. But having the letters is not enough in a random order. You have to make sure they're in the right words and the right uh, sentences. Um, that's equivalent to the analysis. And it's only once you've done those two bits that you can then actually interpret what is being said by those letters and can actually uh, do some kind of action to do that. So a genetic test always has to have at least these three components, but actually that's not enough because you need to have the two ends as well. You need to have patients who are willing to have that test and clinicians who are willing to order it, and then we need to have people who can appropriately give that information back to patients at the end. So a genetic test is not just the sequencing. You have to have the full complement of all of these things to make it actually work in medicine. So I'm going to tell you how we've been doing that for cancer predisposition genes. So if we take the sequencing first, so this is the easiest part of the process these days. The way that we've been doing that, because we really want to try and make this high throughput and large scale, is to do a panel. It's a panel we've made with Illumina, so it's available for anybody. Uh, and most of the labs in the UK and increasingly far further afield are now using this panel. And they can then also make use of all of the validation that we've done. Um, it has about 100 uh, predisposition genes on that. That's about 0.01% of the genome. And the reason it's uh, very um, helpful in this context is it's very simple and robust. It has low template. You only need 50 nanograms, low failure rate, really easy lab process, and very high capacity. So we can, per um, 2,500, do over 500 samples a week. And with this system, you get a median of 500x coverage. The sequencing bit is the easy bit, and it can be fully automated. The analysis. For a clinical test, what you need from your analysis pipelines, it has to be fast, it has to be reliable, and it has to have a short hands-on time. If you need a bioinformatician to look at every one of your tests, that's not going to be a scalable or an affordable option. 
So we explicitly were trying to uh, uh, make that happen and our custom pipeline, we did have to make a custom pipeline, has very short hands-on time, no bioinformatician is necessary to run it, they were needed to set it up and it is very fast for us, it takes about six to eight hours for 96 to 192 samples but that's overnight. Um, underneath that, there's a hell of a lot of stuff that's gone into that. Um, I think we've spent a lot more time actually making uh, this work than I anticipated when we started the programme. A lot of that was done with um, Hurt and Lunter's group here in, um, here in Oxford. Um, and it does take both the small variants and the large exonic deletions and duplications, and uh, it does have high sensitivity and specificity. All of the tools here are available on the website at the bottom, and we're now making a sort of pipeline that can do it all in one, which we'll also make available. So both sequencing and analysis are possible and can be made completely routine. So what about the interpretation? So I think as people will be well aware, this is a, a bottleneck in this uh, field. And the current uh, sort of orthodoxy is uh, of a highly intensive analysis of each variant to decide whether it's pathogenic. Um, but that's not a very scalable solution because panels yield hundreds of variants. As you go to exomes and genomes, you'll have thousands. And it's not a good system because at the end of it, all of that intensive um, activity, you often get um, that it's called a variant of uncertain significance. So that's explicitly not very informative. Um, inevitably leads to ad hoc clinical management. And there is a sort of baseline over prediction. Um, people sort of think, oh, well, I've got a variant. I've got somebody with disease. You know, what are the chances that those are uh, not linked? And the chances are very high because variation is uh, uh, very common, even rare variation, but it's sort of seductive to try and make these links. Uh, and in fact, all variants should be innocent until proven guilty, but often uh, people think about it the other way around. But it is true that if you're doing a test like this, that every single variant has to be triaged into a clinical management category. Once you've ordered a test, your option for inaction has been removed from you. If you decide not to do something, you have positively decided not to do something. So it is true that if you're doing systems like this, every variant has to be triaged into a clinical management category. For over 95%, I think that is automatic, but unlike sequencing and analysis, I don't think you can make interpretation fully automatic. There are going to be less than 5%, but still a sizable proportion, I think, that for at least the time being um, is going to need expert hand curation. And once you get through the ones that are automated, this is seriously expert. People who really understand the genes, really understand the phenotypes, uh, and it may be you're going to have to have that specialisation, certainly at an international um, a level. An ongoing iteration is going to be essential for this system because there are many known unknowns that we need to sort out, not least what is the actual risk of many of these variants, and presumably quite a lot of unknowns known unknowns as well. So the academic sort of variant classification system is, that's currently used, the orthodoxy here, which certainly needs to be broken, is a five-tier system. Um, and I think it's useful to remember that there are two definitions of the word academic, um, that it's relating to education and scholarship, but also of not of practical relevance. Um, and uh, this system uh, perfectly exemplifies both of those. So what are the problems with it? There are, there are a few. Um, one, most of them end up in unknown, so that's not ideal. Second, you've got a five-tier system here, but in the clinic, there's usually only two things. You either are going to do something, you decide what it is, or you're not going to do something, and five into two doesn't go very well. Um, and then you also have um, four different thresholds that you have to decide what you're going to do, and that's where all your energy is, on which side of the threshold is. And quite often what happens is you're spending an awful lot of time down here. Um, is it unlikely to be pathogenic, or is it definitely not pathogenic? It's very hard to say something is definitely not not something. But from the clinical perspective, you're either not going to do something or you're not going to do something. So we really don't want to be spending so much of our energy um, down at that threshold. So explicitly in our systems, we've really focused on thinking what the clinical management um, category should be. So um, as I said, all variants are innocent until proven guilty. So in, in our system, you either manage as clinically relevant, and there has a whole set of protocols for that, or manage as not clinically relevant, and that seems to suit all of our genes. Everything starts in the blue category. So you you know only have one threshold. What is the set of information you need to do in order to get up to red? Um, and certainly for our set of genes, that bar has to be very, very high because people are doing very major things, having entirely healthy parts of their body.
body removed on the basis of these kinds of results. So you don't want things to be classified back down from red to blue. We know that as there's sort of iteration that we may have some uh, information that will, uh, blue will have to go up to red and you have to have those processes whereby you can do that. But it's actually pretty a small number of um, um, variants that um, go into that class. We've done about 800 through this and the ones that we have to do this kind of custom management is very small. For us, if there's a test we can do in the next two to three months that will make a difference between that classification, say it's predicted to affect splicing, we can actually do that. We will do that and that's in our custom management category. If it's something more detailed than that, that goes into research and we'll have to wait until that's sorted out before we can bring that back into the system. Sorry about that. So with this pipe, uh, this processes, we've now got a, a, a very sort of fast and efficient uh, pipeline. It takes about a, a fortnight from uh, receipt of the sample. Um, and from my perspective, certainly once the analysis st stage is done, we do still confirm all of the mutations by Sanger MLPA as appropriate, um, but we can do the interpretation of the whole lot in that time, so it's certainly much more efficient. So I think all of these are doable at high throughput in large volume, but then we also have to think about these, um, these edges. How are we actually going to implement it in the clinic? Uh, and that actually has been quite difficult and has been one of the uh, major bottlenecks, and that's because that involves changing human behaviour. Uh, people don't like change, they suffer their losses more than they appreciate their gains, and they're often quite complicated about why they don't want change. So we had to think about that really um, carefully. Here, the orthodoxy has been that um, if you need a, a gene test, you have to go from oncology to a genetics, have counselling there, have your testing there, go back for the result, and then go back to oncology. Um, that's not a fast, it's a very expensive and it's not a scalable solution. So, uh, but people were pretty wedded to it. So uh, the way that we've been able to get through this and, and has I think uh, been one of the most useful things we've done through the programme and has many um, um, uh, sort of, it's a paradigm that I think applies more broadly, is to think more uh, carefully about the ways in which genetic testing is done. So generally we tend to think of genetic tests as the same, whatever the context it is. But the context in which you're doing that test really does make a difference. So if you're doing a genetic test in somebody with disease, say cancer or heart disease or whatever it is, really that's just normal medicine. It's, it's the same as getting an MRI or a biopsy. You're just trying to put together the panoply of information that you need in order to make that pe person better. That's something that's sort of very well embraced by individuals and societies. We try to make ill people better. Um, there's another context of genetic testing that doesn't apply to many aspects of uh, medicine or tests, where you've got a well person, you're trying to give them a window into the future about what might happen and what they might do about it. That is quite complicated, both at an indiv individual, societal, and certainly in terms of the cost of health systems. Um, when do we want that information? What are we going to do about it? And what's happened is that because um, we've been more focused on the predictive genetics, that uh, people who just want a straightforward medical test are sort of being un unnecessary necessarily and unfairly sort of prejudiced against um, uh, because of this. So what we've done is to separate out medical genetics, which is just medicine, and predictive genetics, um, which is a bit more different. And many medical, uh, many genetic diagnoses are just made in routine medicine. Any um, genetic diagnosis that can be physically diagnosed, Marfan's, Down's, cystic fibrosis, these sorts of things, they're just routinely done um, anyway. So it was, some, it was a sort of exceptionalism about if you're actually reading the DNA to do that. So when we articulated that, both sides were happy that we could go forward in that way. And so the way that we've done this currently is that if it's a, if it's a cancer patient, that can be done by the trained members of the oncology team. Um, all the results are interpreted by genetics, so the interpretation is difficult. If there's a mutation, they automatically have a genetics appointment, so we can go through the complicated issues. If there's no mutation, then um, they don't need, usually don't need any genetics input. They can have one if they want, but it's not routinely done. But currently, the unaffected testing is done in genetics. So we started to implement this with bracket testing in ovarian cancer, and the reason we chose that is over 15% of ovarian cancer is due to germline mutations. It's much higher than people think. Major impact on cancer management, knowing that, and opportunities for cancer prevention. The current systems are very complex um, and perform poorly. There's a huge inequity compared to breast cancer, even though it accounts for more ovarian cancer, bracket mutations than breast cancer cancer. And there's been a lot of renewed interest because the PARP inhibitors have recently been um, licensed. So uh, the system is very simple. So you have a patient with ovarian cancer. The cancer team member gives them an information sheet that we wrote and discuss the bracket testing and takes the blood and sends it to the lab. If they need more discussion, they can have it, but none of them uh, come forward for that. 
We, in genetics, then review and interpret the results. We send the, the result back to the patient and the cancer team with the appropriate information sheet. If they have a mutation, they also get an appointment with that um, uh, result. So the training, again, I think has been quite a, a useful thing we've done and has paradigms for many other things. It's, it's very short, it's very simple, it's based on YouTube videos, they're sort of low-tech videos, you can look at them, they're all online if you want to look at them, and there's some documentation. And so people can access them on their smartphones, if new people come into the system they can just uh, do that uh, when and uh, wherever. We didn't do a randomised trial, that was a, a sort of another orthodoxy we broke there, I can explain how we managed to get through that to anyone who's interested. But we did a six month sort of implementation pilot, during that time 100, 207 women with ovarian cancer were tested. For 133 that impacted their management, uh, because both a positive and a negative result can be important. It's, it's stratifying with respect to the germline status that's important. It certainly did include the 33 that had mutations, so 16% of these women had a BRCA mutation. That had impact for them in terms of their chemo choice and also their breast cancer risk management. It's had big impacts for the family. We've already been able to um, inform and test many relatives. And um, interestingly, importantly, only 10 of these 33 met the current um, eligibility criteria, which are largely based on family history. In fact, none of them had been referred, basically saying that the eligibility criteria don't work and people don't use them. So um, one of the things that's really important is we offered the test to 207 women, every single woman accepted it. And again, that's a bit of a change. People think that people are, have complicated views and they're going to be anxious about this. I think that can be true in the un unaffected situation. But here the decision making was pretty straightforward. I have cancer, you can do a simple blood test that will help me to get a better treatment and potentially you can give information to my rel relatives to um, prevent them from getting cancer. They just put their hands out pretty much. So I think that's another thing we need to um, get our heads around. People want this testing and they understand about it. And the feedback has been very positive, irrespective of whether there was a mutation or not, both from the patient and the and clinician. Um, so, and it's extremely effective and efficient. We've been able to Im implement all of this with no increase in either our budget or our staffing. And our cost savings, because we're doing it at four times the throughput at a quarter of the cost, and the time savings now, because we've not got these extra loops of, of, of um, extra appointments, goes down to less than four weeks. And many units now are adopting all or parts of this process in the UK and, and beyond. So I think it is possible to do all of these things. It really helps if you could, for us, dissecting out into which all the different aspects of it and really see where your bottlenecks actually are. And often um, anywhere which involves people changing is always going to be a major bottleneck that you need to pay attention to. Um, but it is large scale, it's very fast, and, um, and it is um, much more affordable. We're, we're currently uh, charging 300 pounds uh, per test. So um, delivering large scale high throughput genomic testing is possible and can result, I think, in important clinical and economic benefits, and so that sort of dream of the precision medicine. But it does require integration of multiple disciplines and uh, it does require an appetite for change, and sometimes you have to make people hungry. So um, I just want to thank a lot of people. This is a really, it's a national program. There have been lots of people involved, including um, uh, Ingrid and Hurt and various people um, um, here, um, and we're supported by the Wellcome Trust. Thank you very much.